Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I've got a guest video for you. Alex of the channel Religiologue was kind enough to provide this video that is an insight into the different portrayals of Jesus in the four gospels. This is a topic that people frequently ask me to discuss, and Alex has done an excellent job with it. He's currently a PhD candidate and a teaching assistant at the University of California, and is focusing his studies on the history of atheism and the process of deconstruction from religion. He has worked with Dr. Phil Zuckerman, conducting studies on non-belief and apostasy, and is doing his dissertation on the clergy project. His interest in the subject led him to start a YouTube channel that focuses on the academic study of religion and non-religion called Religiologue. Link is in the description. So without further ado, on to the video! Hi everyone, this is Religiolog, and in this video, relying on renowned scholars of early Christianity, I'll talk about the main differences between the four canonical Gospels. If you ever read them, you probably could notice that each of them depicts Jesus very, very differently. In the historical Jesus in Context by Princeton University Press, Dr. Amy Jill Levine presents us with over a dozen various portraits of Jesus. In the Cambridge Companion to Jesus, a range of biblical scholars likewise describe how differently even the canonical Gospels depict Jesus. For example, Dr. Stephen Barton states, the accounts of the life of Jesus in the four canonical Gospels are irreducibly diverse. Each has an integrity of its own. We have to speak of the Jesus of Matthew, the Jesus of Mark, and so on. Harmonization, for example, trying to make all four Gospels say the same thing, is not possible. What it does mean that our knowledge of Jesus will always be partial, always open to correction. For instance, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus before the crucifixion is portrayed in agony. He is confused and in sorrow on his knees, begging his God to take this cap from him. In the Gospel of John, however, there is no agony. Jesus is depicted as a superman who can do anything. He is not in sorrow on his knees and isn't afraid. Instead, the whole cohort of 600 soldiers fall on their knees before Jesus. He even gives them commands and tells them what to do. As John Dominic Crossan explained, Jesus is in command of the whole operation. In Mark, we have Jesus who is out of control, and in John, someone totally in control of the situation. Do you feel the difference? We have a story about two very different people. But why is it so? Let's try to find out. Because even if we'll never be able to understand the real portrait of Jesus, we still may try to reflect on why each evangelist depicted Jesus precisely the way they did. So, my friends, let me try in a very simple way to explain you the difference between the four Gospels of the New Testament. They are Mark, Matthew, Luke and John. All four canonical Gospels were written in different periods of time, decades apart, in different geographical locations and for different groups of people. Therefore, each of them focuses on what exactly concerned the communities of people to whom they were addressed. As a result, the portrait of Jesus in each of them appears diverse. For example, the Gospel of Mark is considered to be the earliest. But according to most scholars, even Mark was written after the year 70, that is, after the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem, or some 40 years or so after the death of Jesus. Mark writes about the life and teaching of Jesus in good Greek language. He writes for Gentile audience and Jews who probably had long ago assimilated far from Judea and didn't understand Aramaic language, that is, the language Jesus spoke. So Mark's audience reads Greek and not Aramaic. He even points to a few phrases in Aramaic and immediately explains their meaning and translation. He also had to explain to his reader Jewish customs and the geography of Palestine. He took disparate elements of oral tradition and a few early written sources and wove them together to create a new narrative. Mark seems to have knowledge of at least one and maybe two or three different collections of miracle stories about Jesus. But in fact, he and his audience are not interested much in the miracles of Jesus. There is no miraculous birth of Jesus here, nor the doctrine of divine pre-existence. This gospel was the first gospel and both Matthew and Luke had it in front of them when they wrote their stories. But they also both disagreed with Mark's version of Jesus, because Jesus here is too humane, too earthly. In Mark, we see an ordinary man who wasn't born as Christ, but who deserved through his deeds to become Christ. 
Dr. James Tabor calls it even anti-gospel, at the same time saying that we can argue that it's the most influential document in the world because it was the original story of Jesus that Matthew and Luke overwrite later. Let's imagine we had only the Gospel of Mark, then it is really hard to think of Jesus as God, since Jesus clearly separates himself from God. When he is called good, Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So he disconnects himself from God. Another example is his phrase on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark is also not interested in the genealogy of Jesus. Here Jesus is often called the Son of Man, and even close disciples don't consider him a deity, but a teacher of wisdom. Jesus is very secretive and cautious, even mysterious. He intentionally keeps people from understanding who he really is and doesn't want anyone to talk about him as Messiah. Only twice Jesus repeat the phrase I am, compare it with John for instance, where Jesus says I am 46 times. Also there is no much emphasis here on the death or resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is the son of man who came to suffer. That is what really important. Many scholars believe that Mark is writing to a persecuted community that after the destruction of Jerusalem lives in hope for the coming of the Messiah during their lifetime. Mark feels the importance to explain why the temple had to be destroyed because this is what really concerned his audience. He shows the suffering Jesus and this seems to comfort those who are also persecuted and await salvation. Jesus here himself looks frightened and confused. He is silent and pitiful. The only words he says on the cross is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And only Mark leaves his reader without post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Jesus simply disappears and that's it. After describing the empty tomb, Mark finishes by saying, Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Of course, Matthew, Luke and John would later disagree with this. They will have a continuation of the story of Jesus after the resurrection and later even the Gospel of Mark will be edited and verses 9 to 20 will be added to the last chapter. And finally, in Mark, Jesus reflects more Hellenistic rather than Judeo-Christian apocalyptic tradition. It might be one of the reasons why the church usually doesn't rely much on the Gospel of Mark in their view of Jesus. Most scholars agree that later both Matthew and Luke used the Gospel of Mark as a source, plus they drew on the Q source. The Q source is a hypothetical written collection of primary Jesus' sayings. Experts can easily identify a common material in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke which is not in the Gospel of Mark. Mark probably wasn't aware of the Q source. In addition, Matthew perhaps used another so-called M source, while Luke used L source. Both of them represent a combination of written and oral sources. See the four source hypothesis for details. Now, let's discuss the Gospel of Matthew. Most scholars believe it was composed between 80 and 90 CE, also in Greek language. A Jewish man who wrote it was clearly writing specifically for the Jews, most likely for those Jews that after the destruction of Jerusalem had been forced out to move north to Galilee or Syria. But keep in mind that due to the two animal controversy in Matthew 21.5, some scholars have come to doubt that the author of Matthew was a Jew. Matthew, more likely as many in his audience, represented the second generation of Christians. After Roman legions destroyed the temple and killed many priests, the Sadducees lost their authority. Without the temple, there was simply no point in them and they quickly disappeared from history. By contrast, their main rivals, the Pharisees, increased their authority. Besides the Torah, they also respected the oral tradition. Before 70 CE, Judaism was tied to the temple and sacrifices in it. Every year, hundreds of thousands of animals were slaughtered on the altar as an offering to Jehovah. And since the Sadducees were responsible for all this, they represented the wealthiest and highly influential class of Judean society. Many things depended on them, while the Pharisees weren't that influential. However, when we read the Gospel of Matthew, the offer makes not the Sadducees, but the Pharisees Jesus' chief enemies and rivals. But why is it so? This doesn't quite reflect reality during the lifetime of Jesus, but it is important for us to understand that Matthew is writing specifically for those Christians who on daily basis compete with the Pharisees. 
They were no longer just scribes, but the leaders of the synagogues, which after destruction of temple turned from just a meeting place into places of worship. The Pharisees replaced temple sacrifices with the importance of spiritual offering for prayer, study of Torah, and so on. The oral tradition continued to gain authority at that time. Many members of Matthew's community more likely just recently attended local synagogues and were friends with those neighboring Jews. The only difference is that now they accepted Jesus as their savior. So Matthew's motivation is clear. He tries with all his might to prove to the reader that Jesus is the embodiment of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. He is the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish law. Matthew often quotes from the Old Testament, he draws on lots of symbolism from Jewish tradition, plus it's important for him to start with the genealogy of Jesus and demonstrate that it goes all the way back to King David and even Abraham himself. He seems to be comparing Jesus with Moses and is talking about the reformation of Judaism, but not about the creation of a new religion. Jesus, just like Moses, came to fulfill the Jewish law and requires his followers to do likewise. But his own people rejected Jesus as Messiah and now God had to turn to Gentiles. This is exactly what concerned those Jewish survivors who relocated to the north. They accepted Jesus, but now they had serious opponents in the eyes of local Pharisees. These early Christians were probably asking, what will happen to us next? What is the ideological future of our religion? And do we need to keep the Jewish tradition if our movement is increasingly becoming Gentile? By the way, Matthew thought they must keep it and even better than the Jewish leaders. He was more likely aware of the influence that Apostle Paul had on the early church, but Matthew obviously disagreed with Paul. For more on that, please watch this video on my channel. Now, let's say a few words about Luke. Scholars believe that Luke himself was certainly not a Jew. Before adopting Christianity, he was a well-educated Gentile. He is the one who wrote the book of the Acts that focuses on the mission to Gentiles. We can even say that it was a two-volume collection where the Gospel of Luke is a kind of preparation for the second volume. For a long time, people thought that Luke was a companion of the Apostle Paul. Today, however, most scholars reject it. The most probable date for its composition is between 80 and 110 CE, and there is evidence that it probably was revised in the second century. The Gospel itself, like the other three, was written in Greek. But in the case of Luke, scholars emphasize that it's presented in a very beautiful literary style, the highest literary quality of anything in the New Testament. Some even compare it with a Greek novel or Roman Christian romance. There are many beautiful verbal expressions and metaphors that hints that the author was the well-educated Gentile probably from a large city. While Mark stresses Jesus as the Son of God who had to suffer and die, and Matthew emphasizes that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah rejected by the Jewish leaders, Luke will focus on Jesus as a Jewish prophet who made a proclamation to his own people, but his people rejected him and therefore the mission had to spread to the Gentiles. Seems as Luke, besides Q source and other sources, uh, has the Gospel of Mark in front of him, but he isn't satisfied with it. He even implicitly criticizes his predecessors for not giving their readers the speeches of Jesus. He heavily relies on the Q source and acts as an ancient historian. He seems to have taken as his model the works of two respected classical authors, Dionysus of Halicarnassus, who wrote the history of Rome, and the Jewish historian Josephus, author of the history of the Jews. Remember, Luke writes his gospel not for the Jews, but for Gentiles that recently converted to Christianity. He even acts as a critic of the Jews, an antagonist of Judaism. At the same time, he deliberately avoids the word Gentiles. We find identical phrases in Matthew and Luke. But where Matthew writes Gentiles, Luke is replacing it with the word sinners. That is, he is afraid of offending Gentiles. One of his main questions is whether Christians can be good citizens of the Roman Empire. How can they fit into the life of Rome and live in harmony with local authorities? That is, the people to whom he addresses his message are concerned with absolutely different issues. Jesus here even resembles the author. He appears to be a noble, well-educated genius. He is a scholar or philosopher. He is also a prophet compared to Samuel or Elijah. 
Jesus even dies not as the Son of God, but as innocent man. If Mark understands Jesus' death as a ransom or substitution for the sins of others, Luke disagrees with Mark. His Jesus dies not for atonement of sins, but so that people may ask for forgiveness. In other words, if you owe me a hundred dollars and you don't have money, there are two ways we can solve it. Either you ask someone to pay your debt for you, or you ask me to forgive you your debt. As you see, it is a big difference. Anyway, let's not go into theology. Probably one day I'll create a separate video on the atonement theory, or in other words, how followers of Jesus, after his death, had to explain why Jesus had to die on the cross. There are many of them. Ransom theory, penal substitution, moral example, satisfaction theory, and so on. Even today, different Christian churches embrace different of them, and it is really fascinating topic, but sorry, not in this video. Luke is the only one who describes the childhood of Jesus, but he is also the only one who ends his story in Rome, in the book of Acts. Unlike in Mark, where, as I've said, Jesus before his death looks confused and silent, in Luke, on the contrary, he clearly understands what is going on and why he is brave and talkative. He utters many phrases before the execution, while carrying the cross, and even on the cross itself. And here he doesn't say, as in Mark, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke writes, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he died. It feels like Mark and Luke were writing about two completely different personalities. And finally, a few words about the Gospel of John, whose Gospel, by the way, stands out from the other three synoptic Gospels as a spiritual one. Here Jesus is depicted not as a man or as a teacher of wisdom, nor as the messenger of heaven or Messiah. In John, Jesus straight away appears almost as God himself, who existed before the creation of the world. He is not mortal, but divine. Jesus' teachings are almost entirely about who he is, and when he demonstrates some miracles, he does it not to help those in need, but mainly to show that what he says about himself is true. Here Jesus pronounces the phrase I am 46 times. Can you imagine? In Mark and Luke, for instance, he does it only two times, but here 46 times. The Gospel was more likely compiled somewhere between the 90 and 110 CE by someone from what scholars call Johannine community, although we don't know who the author was. In the Gospel we may find different portraits of Jesus. In some parts he is divine, but in some he is humane. Experts explain that probably it's because the author relied on different sources that were written at various periods of time and therefore represent different theological assumptions and views of Jesus. John is even more anti-Jewish than Luke. Scholars are still debating why, but one popular view is that the Johannine community started out as a group of Jews in Palestine who believed in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Over time, they were forced to leave Palestine and their views of Jesus changed, he became more divine. But John also seems to write his message to the community of Christians who are in the very tense and even warlike relationship with the local Jewish community, and some of them most likely themselves once belonged to this community. It reflects the debate between the church and the synagogue, and it claims that the Jews don't know and don't follow God's will at all. The phrase the Jews is almost always used as a negative term of abuse. From being chosen people, they became the enemies of God. In the beginning, I already mentioned that Jesus looks like a superman here. He is in charge of the operation and knows what to expect. In other words, he is not a suffering Messiah who is confused and keeps silence on the cross. Not at all. He absolutely controls the situation. But what is also interesting is that according to John, Jesus dies on a different day than in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Here he doesn't eat Passover meal and dies not on the day after Easter, but on the day before it when thousands of lambs being slaughtered all at one time in Jerusalem. It means that in John's Gospel, Jesus hanging on the cross while the lambs are being slaughtered for Passover. It has very symbolic meaning for John and his theory of autonomy. Jesus symbolizes a sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So it is a very different story with different theology and understanding of the autonomy. In conclusion, we may see that all four Gospels are very different from each other. They were written at different times, in different places, and for different people. Therefore, they address different problems and at the same time often contradict each other.
All of them were anonymous and the names Mark, Matthew, Luke and John were attributed to them much later. And with a high probability, none of the authors of this text, whoever they are, ever met Jesus in person. Which makes our attempt to find out a real historical portrait of Jesus impossible. For example, in the Cambridge Companion to Jesus, in chapter 10, The Quest for the Real Jesus, Francis Watson writes, The real Jesus of the historian is typically a greatly reduced Jesus, since somewhat between about 50 and 90% of the gospel material is regarded as too problematic to be useful historically. The real Jesus differed significantly from the composite image of him created by the evangelist. A Yale scholar, Dale Martin, in his work concludes, We've already seen that the New Testament contains contradictory historical accounts of various parts of the early Christianity. The New Testament is simply not a reliable source for the history of Jesus or early Christianity when taking at face value. Plus, please remember that some passages of the Gospels have been edited much later, in the 2nd or 3rd centuries. For example, the ending of Mark's Gospel, or the story of the woman taking in adultery in John 7, or the passage that affirms the doctrine of Trinity in 1 John, and most likely the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Along with other scholars, Bart Ehrman also believes that first two chapters of Luke were later edition. The original narrative included 1-4 and would then have moved directly from 1-4 to what is now 3-1. And those are just a few examples. All this raises another important question. When first Christians read those gospel stories, did they take them literally or not? For example, John Crossan thinks not. It was we who, after the Reformation of the 16th century, brought the understanding of the Bible to a certain sacred status, where each of its letters must be perceived as a direct revelation of God. But those people in the first centuries didn't take them literally. My friends, I hope that this video was helpful, and at least to some degree you felt why the biblical studies as an academic discipline is meaningful. Without understanding the historical context explained by experts in the field, it is hard to realize why the books of the Bible are written the way they are. That's all from me today. My friends, believe me, it takes a lot of energy and many hours to read various academic books and to summarize it for you into a short video review while translating it into a simple non-academic language. So I hope you value my work and would support my channel with your likes, comments, by sharing this video with others or by a donation. The links are in the description. Thank you for watching till the end and please check out my other videos. I wish you peace and health wherever you are. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Alex for providing this guest video. Don't forget to check out his channel Religiolog by following the link in the description. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorship manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the super Jesus from the Book of John that supports the human fallible Jesus of Mark that is my channel. If you'd like to make people think that I'm more powerful than I am, you can join Religiolog on Patreon at patreon.com slash four Religiolog. That's the number four, not four all spelled out. You can join mine too if you want, but Alex did this one so if you liked it, go to his Patreon. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO Box address is in the description. See you next time!